most of us only really know about or heard about the Black Dragon Fighting Society, you know, because of blood sport. And of course, Frank Dukes is the undefeated heavyweight Kumite champion, right? So give us um, some history about, like, if somebody doesn't know, and a lot of us don't, like, what is the Black Dragon Fighting Society exactly? Okay, well, in, uh, in regards to Frank Dukes, he, he doesn't utilize, originally didn't utilize the Black Dragon Fighting Society. If you watch the film, he mentions the Kurukai. Okay. And, uh, which, which Cole is black, Ru is dragon, and Kai is place. So there's no mention of fighting society. Hmm. He mentions the, just the Kodukai as an organization, the International Fighting Arts Association. That's what he alludes to and mentions in Bloodsport. And also in the, originally in the article in Black Belt Magazine. Now, when you look back, the Kodukai was a, for lack of a better term, a Japanese military organization put together by various members of the Japanese military as a ultra right wing um, organization. Um, they were also placed in regards to attempting to bring Japan back to its former glory after its defeat to the Allied forces in World War II. So that's, that's what's in reference to Kodukai. Now, the Black Dragon Fighting Society, however, was created by John Keehan, later to be known as Count Juan Rafael Dante. And he put this organization together in the 1960s, and I believe it was due to certain Chinese martial arts societies that were known, uh, such as the Green Dragon uh, Fighting Society, uh, with the Black Cobra Hall, which he had uh, an incident with in the, the Dojo Wars. But this was his way of having a, a listing, an organization that he created that was to oversee various Chinese martial arts. As a matter of fact, I have the uh, World's Deadliest Fighting Secret, the original edition by Count Dante, right in my hands. Cool. And it was a page that talks about the Black Dragon Fighting Society. It states the following. The Black Dragon Fighting Society is a world-renowned fighting arts organization dedicated to the fighting systems of Kung Fu, Tai Chi Chuan, Chuan Fa, Kempo, Xingyi, Pakwa, and Shaolin Boxing. The secret society teaches the most savage, deadly, and terrifying arts known to man and has at its membership the world's top experts in the Oriental Fistic and grappling systems. To qualify, an applicant must be a master of, or at least a high-ranking expert in one of the few acceptable oriental defense forms. Many world-famous champions have been unable to meet the strict requirements and have failed to gain entrance or admission into the forbidden society that is sworn to the arts of death. The exact membership and training procedures are closely guarded secrets of the membership who are sworn to secrecy and joined together through their initiation ceremony of blood. Hmm. Isn't that decorative? Aren't now, you a... Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Ma'am, I am a member of the Black Dragon Fighting Society. Yes, I am. And I, if you notice, in most of my bios, I don't mention it. And that was because of, a, of a, 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 an incident that occurred between myself and Bill Aguiar years ago. And only recently am I mentioning it because people are asking me regarding it and know that I did know Bill Aguiar. I, I did go to the, uh, the Taunton death matches. Um, you know, I was accepted by Bill Aguiar as a member of the Black Dragon Fighting Society and as the World Karate Federation. Real now, quick, Joe, how did you get in? Like, because the, the pamphlet kind of um, alludes to, you know, it's not easy to get in, basically. <laughs> How I got involved was I met Bill Aguiar after Mr. Parker's death in, in uh, 1991. Um, he had his major studio in Fall River, Massachusetts. Now, at the peak, he had uh, three studios in Fall River, Massachusetts, New Bedford, Massachusetts, and Taunton, Massachusetts, during the Kung Fu craze in the 1970s. 
So I was standing outside the door of his studio, just looking through the window, looking at the various photos of his students and classes. And Bill Aguiar walks right by me to go open up the studio. And he looks at me and goes, can I help you? And uh, I had actually met Bill Aguiar years before. I had a friend of mine, Maggie Cloutier, that was interested in taking classes. And she had asked for me to accompany her. And uh, he had this beautiful studio at the time in an old whaler's mansion in Fall River. And, um, you know, I was watching what he was teaching her. And I'm going, this is Kempo. This, this is not even Kempo. This is at Parker's Kempo. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, so uh, we talked for a very short time. But again, I met him years later. And um, with the door, the two words that got me in the door, Ed Parker. I had worked with Mr. Parker from 1983 until his death in 1990. Uh, many times Mr. Parker demonstrating on me at numerous demonstrations and seminars throughout New England and also in, uh, in Pikesville, Maryland, at uh, instructor camps, etc. cetera. So um, that's what got me in because uh, in uh, the book Battle Axe, A Warrior's Tale by John McSweeney, the father of Irish karate, he talked about taking classes with Mr. Parker during the weekdays in the afternoon while living in California. And included in those afternoon classes was one, John Kean, who had left the USKA and had gone to train with Mr. Parker in Kempo. Mm -hmm. So basically, you didn't have to have a, a, a death match in order to get in the Black uh, Dragon Fighting Society. No, no, I mean, <laughs> Nothing as know, cool as that, right? <laughs> well, you know what? It sells comic books, right? Oh, yeah, and it does. It, where, did, where, did this book originate, where, did, where did this book originate from? In comic books. Do you know at one point, uh, Bill Aguilar once told me that, and he had the receipts, that how much Count Dante was paying Marvel and DC and other men's magazines to have his ads hmm. came up to $10,000 a month. Which would be like a hundred thousand these days. You betcha. That's which crazy. Means imagine the kind of money he was making off the books in order to be able to pay that out. Wow. Crazy. But uh, that's what got me in the door. I was, uh, I was, uh, I had worked with Mr. Parker. I was an IKK member, and going to the World Karate Federation. If you were an IKK member, you were accepted into the World Karate Federation. Well, let and me ask you this, man. Like, what, what's the actual benefit of being a member of the, uh, you know, the Black Dragon Fighting Society? Other than like, hey, that's a cool title. Like, w w what's the benefit? Well, at the time, uh, you were able to uh, get, uh, they, were, they were creating manuals for different ranks. Um, basically, the, the system of Dante that was presently taught was a combination of Kodokan Judo, uh, Jiu Jitsu, uh, Tracy Ed Parker, and later Tracy Kempo. Because that's the first thing I noticed. First time I ever saw them do a class. They dropped into a meditating horse stance and clothes, and that was their salutation. And that was the old salutation that Ed Parker would use in the 1950s. Hmm. And six, you're doing Kempo. You know, and it's like the old joke either in Dunesbury or uh, or uh, uh, Bloom County. We have met the enemy, and they are us. <laughs> you know? Hmm. So when I watch Kempo people make fun of Count Dante in the World's Deadliest Fighting Secret book, I have to laugh. I go, D dude, you know what? That one figure you're pointing at him, you got four others pointing at you. You know, and that, that's the key. I mean, that was one of the foundation arts. Also learning poison hand strikes, which are various open hand strikes, which are basically the, one of the main elements of what the world's deadliest fight and secret book is all about. It's various poison hand strikes. Mm. Uh, Kung Fu and Kenpo, and um, he just organized them in the book. Hey, let me ask you this, man. So whatever happened to you and Bill Aguiar? You guys aren't cool anymore then? Oh, he's dead. What? Oh, no, I mean his son. What's his son? Oh, no, I talked I talk to his son now. And, you know, because, uh, look, simply stated, I've watched everything that's gone on with Frank Dukes and Ashita Kim and Don Miskell and recently a, a person I knew, Brad Marshall. And, you know, none of them trained long enough with Count Dante to make, to make it worth a lick. Um, most of them didn't. Uh, other people I mentioned, like Lawrence Day, you can look up on YouTube, Lawrence Day, going, look, I had a drinking problem at the time. I trained for like a couple of weeks with him, occasional classes, and that was it. He freely admits it himself. So, you know, Frank Dukes, um, 
you know, I have, I have, there, uh, Frank Dukes was never mentioned, according to Bill Aguiar, and Bill Aguiar simply stated was the rightful inheritor to Count Dante's curriculum. Okay. If you look at 1976, there was a three-part article written by Masaba Yu, who, by the way, is still alive, and you can ask him personally about it. He's, uh, I believe he's 75 years old. He's one of the premier handgun experts who teaches seminars all over the world. He has uh, the Masaba Yu method, and he's out of Florida now, originally from Massachusetts. He did a big three-part article, one of the longest articles, by the way, ever written in the history of Black Belt Magazine. Mm. And it's all done at Bill Aguiar's school. I find it's really funny when I see these so-called alleged Black Dragon Flying Society members who aren't sit there and use photographs from that article, which is where? Bill Aguiar's school at Fall River, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, many of them can't even pronounce the guy's name. If I had a quarter for every time somebody called him Aguilar, I'd put a down payment on a Porsche. You know, they, they can't even pronounce the man's name correctly. <laughs> but, you know, the bottom line is, like, you know, we talk about Ashita Kim. So Ashita Kim publishes the world's deadliest fighting secrets illegally. Mm -hmm. And um, at one point, I worked for Bill Aguiar's father uh, doing telemarketing for a studio, doing cold calls. And he mentioned about Ashita Kim. He's like, that's Ashita Kim guy. Blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, Joe, contact. All right. So I emailed him. So he emails me back and he says, you've got to spend $10,000 for a death mask challenge and you've got to fly me in and you've got to pay for my hotel accommodation. And I write him back and I go, look, I have no interest in any of that. I'm not, I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm just saying that the book you publish, The World's Deadliest Fighting Secret, you publish it in its totality. Hey, there's a phone number on the inside back cover. Why don't you call that phone number? It's been in service for the last 26 years. Well, one day I go into work for telemarketing and Bill Ang goes, you're never going to believe who called me. I said, I don't know who called you. He went, Ashita Kim. I was like, really? Wow. I want to see. Well, sit down and listen to this. So Ashita Kim claimed that he had first met Count Dante at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago in 1967, I believe it is. You can look up the year that the actual Democratic Convention was held in Chicago. But if you look at Radford Davis it's Rashida Kim's real name. Sure. And look at his chronological age. What was he, 10? Maybe 11? Mm -hmm. What did he do? Stop by the convention on his way back from Little League? You know, do you think that the you know, Grand Master Count Dante sat there and taught his deepest, darkest secrets to a, to a, to a preteen? You know, so I look into stuff and they've got their, whole, their stories have got more holes than a colander. Mm. It's just... I just look at them and go, no, man, this doesn't make sense. So basically, Ashita Kim and Frank Dukes, just to catch everyone up to speed, as far as I know, based on what you say, they latched and connected themselves to Dr. Lawrence Day, who had a couple weeks of training with the, the, the Black Dragon Fighting Society curriculum, and then they wanted to latch on to him and say, oh, we're members too, basically. Right. And let's talk about where Lawrence Day comes from. Now, ironically, he studied an art called Shaolin Do, which was brought to America by two Indonesian gentlemen, Sin Fei, and I, I, the name of his brother is eluding me right now. Who, by the way, I just met last weekend at Dragon Fest. Blew my mind. Here he is with one of his top guys walking by and went, Oh, I might walk right up to Shin Fei. And I start going into this whole dissertation about his background and his brother and how they had learned from a person who suffered from the dog face boy um, uh, disease that, you know, the excessive facial hair makes you look like, a, like an animal, like a dog, like a werewolf. And how they had come to the United States in the 1960s and got involved in tournaments and whatnot. So that was the system that Lawrence Day had rank in. That is what he studied. Mm hmm. So his, his, and like I said, this is not something where I'm just throwing things in the air. No, there is a interview that is on YouTube on the internet where Lawrence Day clearly states how little training he had with Count Dante. Now you want to talk to people who really trained with him, who were well-known martial arts practitioners. Well, you have to mention Jimmy Jones, who unfortunately passed away recently. And Al Jean Kaluuya from the Karate Institute. Those two gentlemen were direct students and black belts from John Kean. You okay. can also see footage of John Kean. 
uh, from uh, an interview that was done on a television program that he was featured on about his world championships that he was doing. Um, but if you look at the material, even Ashita Kim doing, quote unquote, the kata dante, it's not a stinking kata. There is no kata associated. A kata is a pre-designed form. What it is, is a self-defense technique. One of many that go over a plethora of poison hand strikes, which if you know Kenpo and Kaju Kenpo and some of these other Kenpo-based systems, you recognize many of the movements in that single technique. If you're telling me you're basing your entire system on one single technique, you're sadly mistaken. The Dante system is based on a lot more than that. What do you think of this? This comment from JD. Black Dragons have had very bad publicity over the years because of members like Frank Dukes and Ashita Kim. Do you think that's true, or do you think people don't even give a shit about the Black Dragon Society anymore? No, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. You know, I was just reading an article recently that someone had written about Count Dante and, and Frank Dukes and how they basically stated that if you look at Frank Dukes' story and you go back to read that old three-part article in 1976 in Black Belt Magazine, you'd swear he's quoting some of this stuff verbatim. Mm. That he just, he's just a, a Count Dante wannabe. Now, I'm, now I'm, I'm, first of all, I am not sitting there and talking about, you know, what his physical – training is as far as his physical ability i've seen people look at his martial arts material and say it's a bunch of junk i've seen other people go no there's some legitimate stuff i know people that were hired by frank dukes to teach at his studio um matter of fact while we're on that topic um can i mention one thing about a person that you had mentioned to me recently and you mentioned on one of your broadcasts recently um sure. david jr yeah, so David Dukes. German fought in the Kumite, according to Frank Dukes, right? Nah, it's the other way around. You know, it's like, so um, I was on Gary Lee, who runs the Sport Karate Museum, one of his podcasts, and the guest was Frank Dukes. And in the conversation, I mentioned about David German. And suddenly, Frank Dukes perks up, David German, I went to David German's events. And I'm sitting there saying, so uh, what you're telling me is that you based the Kumite off the tournaments that you attended that David German ran? Because hmm. they were pretty wild events back then. Um, if you ever watched the UFC and you watched the classic example of what a boxer in the early UFCs had to fight, and a lot of people were making jokes. Why is he only wearing one glove? Ha, ha, ha. What, he couldn't afford a second one? No, because in David German's events... He would allow people to wear one boxing glove and one free hand. So if they wanted to grapple and use their jujitsu skills, at least they had one hand that they could make, do naked strangles, chokes, wrist locks, arm bars, etc. Mm -hmm. That's where the UFC and the Gracies got their idea for that, as well as several other ideas from David German's tournaments. Okay. And you can see an interview where Joe Jennings interviews David German and discusses this on YouTube. And it's part of a four-volume series that were put up by Panther Productions. And I was talking recently to Don Warner and mentioning about David German and hoping that he will re-release because he now has the rights through Black Belt Magazine to re-release the entire Panther Production videos collection. And I'm hoping that they re-release the four videos. But you can find the interview with him and Joe Jennings on YouTube. And he talks about that. Okay. Hey, let me let me read this comment because I do want to talk about about this a little bit. Uh, Tom Hawk said the Black Dragon Fighting Society still exists under the control of Bill Aguiar, the son of Dante's successful William V. Uh, Aguiar. And I talked to Bill, you know, and funny enough, he really wants to fight Frank Dukes. Oh, <laughs> you like you would not believe. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. He wants, he wants that wants, fight. Yeah. He want he wants to give him greetings from the land of beatings. Yeah. No doubt about it. You know, he wants to fight Dukes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Very much so. So yeah, no you problem. you and Bill are pretty close, right? We're, we're friends. We're acquaintances now. Yeah. That took, that took a long time. But do, yes. do you know what what he's actually doing, though? Like, is there, like, a curriculum? Is he training people? Is he just keeping the brand alive because he thinks the brand has value? Like, how active is this thing uh, these days? Well, again, right now there is a black belt. There is a, a black dragon fighting society website. Mm -hmm. There's also like uh, I forget the address. Please accept my apologies. But if you look up uh, black dragon fighting society store, 
you will see that he's doing this big mer mercantile uh, um, endeavor because a lot of people they they love they love the whole story behind it. They love when they were kids to buy a copy of the world's deadly fighting secrets. They love the the legacy and the mystery of Count Dante. So and so you know everybody wants a Count Dante uh, uh, or a Black Dragon Fighting Society T-shirt, or they want um, you know uh, you know it's like it's like the classic phrase from uh, Mel Brooks in uh, Spaceballs. What's the secret? Merchandising. Hmm. Space flamethrower. You know, so if you want to get towels and, and duffel bags and patches and, and stickers and whatnot about the Black Dragon Plus Fighting Society, he owns the rights to it. Okay, but he's not like teaching anybody the deadly secrets these days, right? I just don't, he's still accessible to do seminars and instruct people in it. You know, let me tell you about Bill, Bill Aguiar Jr. So when, when Bill was teaching his son, you know, you always remember, you remember the, the, the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? Uh, I Probably if I heard it, I, I, I can't pull it up in my memory so, bank right now. <laughs> I mean, and it, 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 listen to the song, and it's about this guy whose father named him Sue. And because of that, he was always having to fight. He'd always have to, the, the, you know, some guy would give him a smirk or a girl would giggle, and he'd have to defend himself. And in a way, that's kind of the story with Bill Aguiar's son. Bill Aguiar wanted to make sure that no one would be able to question his son's ability to fight. So what did he do? He literally put him in every type of martial arts tournament and endeavor. Mm. This person has competed in AAU karate tournaments. He's competed in AAU taekwondo tournaments. He's competed in AAU judo tournaments. He's competed in open tournaments, including one that I ran in the city of New Bedford. He also has competed at the Black Ships Festival in sumo competition. Wow. He has literally done, he's competed in, in, uh, in PAL boxing events. He has literally competed in every major form of fistic or grappling endeavor that was available pre-UFC and MMA. That's why he wants to fight Frank Dukes, to get a piece of the uh, undefeated heavyweight Kumite champion. You know what? Is that, wouldn't that be wild debate? What happened? Well, he, if he's undefeated champion, I beat him. What's that make me? Yeah, pretty damn right? good is what it makes him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as far as that goes, but I'm again, I'm clarifying this once in a while, and I'm naming names. The following individuals do not, I repeat, do not have the right nor the authorization to use the Black Dragon Fighting Society. They are Frank Dukes. Ashita Kim, Don Miskell, and recently Brad Marshall. Well, that's really shocked when Brad Marshall got involved with Miskell. Hmm. And let me tell you something. I want to clarify another important point here, David. This isn't something where I'm just talking behind somebody's back. At the Action Martial Arts event, one year, Jim Brian Fury brought in Ashita Kim and also Don Miskell. And I told both of these gentlemen to their face that neither one of them had the right nor the authorization to use the Black Dragon Fighting Society name. Mm -hmm. I have no problem saying that to anyone. I am a martial arts historian. And simply stated, all things considered, hey man, I got no fish to fry. Sure. Because if I was really that adamant about the organization, gee, don't you think I'd mention it in all my bios and all these different books I've been in? Mm -hmm. But I don't. But recently, because I saw these people doing this miscarriage of justice and falsely claiming to be members of, of Count Dante's organization and be the inheritor of the Black Dragon Fight Society, those are lies. The only person who I know for a fact has received the authorization to do so is Bill Aguiar Sr. and the inheritor of that is his son, Bill Aguiar Jr. Okay. That's it. Nobody else that I know of. The only other person that I know of that was associated with that would be Mr. John Cole and certain individuals that were black belts under Bill Aguiar over the years. One mm. German Walker. Um, Bill Aguiar did an updated um, a reprint of the World's Deadliest Fighting Secret, adding 33 more pages about the Dante system. Um, Walter was featured prominently in the photos that were originally done with uh, Doug Dwyer, with uh, Count Dante, with the original text. Um, you know, those are the people, those are the people that really did the system. I mean, like I said, it wasn't like he was hiding. He did three commercial schools. If you look in old issues of official karate yearbook, you will find on I on the East Coast, 
You will always see Bill Aguiar mentioned. You will see him featured, I want to say, in the 1976 um, official karate uh, yearbook, a full-page photo, and a mention of Bill Aguiar as Count Dante's inheritor. You will see, like I said, he's been also mentioned in official karate's defense combat. There's an, uh, an article and there's been small mentions about him and also an extensive article on him and his training. This is all available as easily as eBay, folks. This sure. is stuff that's hidden and not known. 